I'm joined now by Greg Bell of the Tacoma News Tribune uh, to preview this 49ers Seattle Seahawks matchup this weekend. Greg, thanks for spending a couple minutes with me to break this one down. You're welcome. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. You know, the big story that a lot of people have been following across the country outside of football is this flooding that the San Francisco area and California area has seen. Is there going to be any impact that you expect at Levi Stadium? I don't think that's a dome. Are we are we in for any kind of weather related delay this weekend? I don't think delay, Carolyn, but I think it's a mitigating factor that helps Seattle and anytime Seattle plays in rain, it's, it's Seattle's used to that, but it's a natural turf field. It's been raining, as most people know, quite a bit in Northern California for this month. And there's supposed to be at least a half inch of rain on Saturday with winds maybe 20 miles an hour is the forecast. 100% chance of rain, so it is absolutely gonna rain. And a sloppier, slower track would help Seattle, I think. And it would help a defense that has had trouble stopping the run on dry fields. And so the muddier, the better in Seattle's uh, case. Now, of course, the field is NFL standard. It has they will have it in deep condition, but I do think the weather is going to be one of a few mitigating factors here that is in Seattle's favor. I do want to talk a little bit more about the run game in detail on both sides, but from the macro view with what Seattle has been able to do this season, sneaking into the playoffs like this, a lot of people consider them an underdog this weekend that the weather might be in their favor. When you assess everything that Pete Carroll has done, where would you rank this season in terms of taking a team that was supposed to be quote unquote rebuilding at the departure of Russell Wilson and here comes Geno Smith, a fit for this system, and all of a sudden they find themselves in the playoffs. I mean, how impressive is this? Yeah, Carolyn, I think of all the cities and 13 of them now here in Seattle, this season validates Pete Carroll's system works. And he's not the leather era football guy that 71 year old, the game passed by that obviously his brand works. And what his brand is, is really invested in the player, really a interpersonal relationship with coach to player, his assistants, the position coaches, uh, they really get into deeply with the families and wives and kids. During the pandemic, Carolyn, he had at the Seahawks expense, paid for trailers to be set up, not just for the players that the NFL are having testing every day, but for the players, families, wives, children. And they came anytime and every time. And they were getting tested as much as we were and the players were. And stuff like that. Uh, when players had visitors come in from out of town during the pandemic, Carol said, we don't care who you bring in and that's fine, but just come to the, make them come to our facility. We'll test them for free and make sure that they're clear. They were the only team in two seasons that didn't have a COVID-19 positive until the end of 2021. Carol's system, it, it really does, the intangibles matter to him. The loose, the rap music blaring on the, on the sidelines during practices, the rap stars and Drake and Kendrick Lamar come to practice and Will Ferrell and Neil Tyson DeGrasse, I could go on and on about the people who roll through the Seahawks practices. Personally, I'll forever be indebted to Pete Carroll because it was after that Patriots Seahawks Super Bowl that everybody remembers. I was tasked, I was working with NBC at the time, and I was tasked to interview the losing coach. And I knew <laughs> if it was going to be Bill Belichick, he would never talk to me. And I knew if it was going to be Pete Carroll, he would be maybe the most gracious coach in the league. And he did not disappoint. I mean, in the wake of what was a terrible memory that I won't bring up too much. I mean, his demeanor, the way that he approached that interview, the way he approached the players after that game, I was sold, you know, for life. And his approach and his mantra and the way that he does things, he has never deviated from that. And so it is for me personally kind of gratifying to see all of those pieces sort of fit together with this puzzle that includes Geno Smith, a guy who's on his fourth NFL team and is seemingly reinventing himself in this system at 32 years of age, his ninth year in the league, which is kind of unheard of. I mean, what a redemptive sort of gratifying, justifying, whatever verb you want to use. What, what a year for him as well. Not only that, after trading Russell Wilson, they have the fifth overall pick, Carolyn, in the upcoming draft because of how poorly Wilson and the Broncos did. It's going to be the highest pick the a playoff team has had in 20 years. So this has gone incredibly well. And even Carol's surprised about the fifth pick and having it that high after trading Wilson. But to your point, when you saw him at the Super Bowl in Arizona, I was at that game as well. That was his lowest point of his career, even at, lower than getting cut and fired by the Jets and the Patriots 
his first NFL go around. It's so close to immortality, two Super Bowl championships in a row, all those players that would have banked on that and, and some of whom would get Hall of Fame consideration. If you win two Super Bowls in a row, how much more your chances go up for a Super Bowl or for Hall of Fame, all of that. And he did handle it. He was shocked. I mean, that even the next morning at the hotel in Phoenix, it was an unlike because he was shaken and, and how he knew he had to rally the team after that. And there was some fractures and frissures and that locker room was really upset for a long time after that game. But he weathered that. And he had the backing of the Allen family. Paul Allen passed away a few years ago, and Jody Allen, his sister, is the owner now, who has carried on, as Paul Allen did, saying, Pete Carroll, this is your system, your deal, your program. We're not deviating from that. He's had the ownership backing. His GM has been in lockstep with him. He hired the GM. Carroll was hired a couple weeks before John Schneider was. He has a first-time GM who technically is under him in football authority. And Carroll has been able to do restart. And really, this is the second restart of the – this is a lot like 2012 and the draft picks and the success and then getting into the playoffs and maybe not quite being good enough for a Super Bowl but then tasting it. It's a lot like that right now. And not many coaches in the NFL these days, Carolyn, get, get that opportunity to stay that long and know and have the uh, security to know you can restart. Yeah, I remember how nervous I was standing in that hallway. And I remember how furious the players were. I mean, Marshawn Lynch, the guys coming through, they were so mad. And I was so scared because I was worried about my bosses and, and whether or not I was going to get this interview, which is the only thing that I had been tasked with the entire Super Bowl. And I remember jumping out at him in the hallway and saying, Pete, can I grab you? Can I talk to you? And I just remember he was so shell-shocked, like a deer in headlights. And he looked at me and said, I need to go talk to my team first, if that's okay. And I said, of course, yeah. You know, my producer that was there in the hallway was like, Carolyn, calm down. <laughs> like, yeah. let him go talk to the team. Give him a minute. But um, like I said, I just, there was something so human about him in that moment and the grace with which he handled that and how kind he was to everybody in the midst of all that, I just found to be so kind of revealing about who he is as a person. And you see that on the sidelines all the time. So you mentioned the draft pick that they have. Now, what do they do? here moving forward with Geno Smith? I mean, what do you forecast at the quarterback position now? Well, he's changed their thinking. When they traded Russell Wilson, the thinking was, let's just have our quarterback coming out of the 2023 draft. We're going to have four picks in the first two rounds thanks to this trade. The draft is loaded with what scouts think are NFL caliber, NFL ready quarterbacks coming out of college, CJ Stroud, Bryce Young. We'll get our quarterback by then and we'll have Drew Locke or Geno Smith for one year and their contracts will end. Well, now Smith's performance in making the Pro Bowl and setting four team season records, breaking Russell Wilson's three of them for completion percentage and completions and yards, he's changed their thinking. And maybe we re-sign him for two or three years, give him a deal that is going to be probably north of $25 million. He's making $3 million this year, Carolyn. He has had seven consecutive years of one-year deals. He hasn't had a multi-year contract since his rookie deal with the Jets he signed in 2013. That's what's at stake for Geno Smith. He can stand to make more money on the market by how he plays on Saturday in the playoff game, his first career playoff start. But the Seahawks won him back. I asked them after the Rams game, just in case it was their final game. We didn't know how the Lions-Packers game was going to play out then. But I said, hey, in your perfect world, how would you want it to be between now and free agency starting in March? What do you want? And he said, well, it's a business. I know it's a business. They have decisions to make. I have business and decisions to make as well. And what that told me is that he wants to test free agency. Mm -hmm. And at age 32, he knows this might be his only chance at the big free agent riches that players who have been in the league 10 years normally get and he has not had. So he's going to go from $3, $3 million this year to perhaps 25 to $30 million a year next year, 10 times <laughs> because of how he performed. They're looking at Ryan Tannehill's salary at $29.5 million in Tennessee, a 35-year-old quarterback who's not a Pro Bowl quarterback this year, who's not in the playoffs. That's an easy comp that his side can tell the Seahawks, hey, if the Seahawks don't want him to even test the market, which is going to be rich, they could franchise tag him. That'll be $32 million and a half if they do the uh, exclusive. If they do something like a transition tag, it'd be more like $30 million. That's a lot of money, and that would be a one-year deal. Then perhaps you draft a quarterback you don't have to start next year. You could have him as a project for a couple of years, but – they have a lot of other needs, defensive line, stopping the run, interior offensive line, linebacker they could use with those top picks in the draft. 
he certainly deserved the the right, the opportunity to test the market if he wants to. I mean, if for no other reason than the perseverance to kind of stick around one year deal after one year deal. What is your sense or I guess what would you do? I'm asking you to look into the crystal ball a little bit. But do you see a scenario where he gets tagged? Do you think that there's a situation where Seattle would let him walk and focus on the draft? I mean, do you have any sense early on of what might ultimately happen? My sense is that. Pete Carroll is so into the interpersonal, Carolyn, as we've talked about, that in situations like this, he hopes that holds sway and that perhaps they could re-sign him for 20 to 25 million for a couple of years with upfront bonuses. And because Seattle made him a starting quarterback and who he was this year, that he comes back because he's familiar with them. And yeah, he could probably get a little bit more in the open market and maybe Seattle hopes that that's what they do. They'll probably offer him something like that before the market opens. But again, 32 years old, having sat on benches for seven years for four different teams. If I were him and they don't franchise tag him, I would go to the market and I'd at least say, okay, here's what they're offering me. And other teams are offering me Seattle. Do you want to match this? Uh, I don't, the the Seahawks rarely use franchise tags. They've used them twice under Carolyn Schneider. One was for Orlando Mari, a kicker when they first took over the regime. The other time was for Frank Clark, who they ended up trading to the chiefs soon after they tagged them. I don't, the most expensive tag in the league, obviously, is quarterback. I don't see them tagging him because they don't want to deny him free agency if the, a look if that's what he wants to do. They, they are so into the interpersonal that if a guy gets that close to the market and they don't and he doesn't take the Seahawks offer, they'll say, OK, you shop and give us a chance to match. It's interesting. I mean, we're going to have to kind of see what happens after this run is done and just kind of coming back around and focusing on what they're going to be up against against the 49ers on Saturday. How winnable is a game like this for Seattle heading into this weekend with so much at stake? And what will they need to do better that we haven't seen in the last couple of games? Well, it's the least winnable of any matchup in the league, Carolyn, because of how San Francisco plays. They run the ball. Seattle's terrible at stopping the run. Any team that consistently has run the ball four quarters against Seattle has won, including Tampa Bay, which at the time of that game in Munich in November was the 32nd ranked run team in the in the league. And by the second quarter, they'd already eclipsed their average for games and running the ball. Carolina, Las Vegas. I could go on and on of teams that have stuck with Atlanta, New Orleans. Teams that they should have beat, playoff teams should beat. I mean, for, they lost the entire NFC South. Uh, they should beat teams with even a passable run defense. That, or they just don't have it. And San Francisco's run for 186 and 170 in the two games against them. Now they have Elijah Mitchell and Christian McCaffrey, who in those first two games San Francisco didn't have against Seattle but at the same time. So they need turnovers. Seattle does. They need, as I said, the wheel to be sloppy, windy, the field to be muddy. They need to get better third down, shorter third downs on offense, better production on first and second down. So it's not third in San Jose Airport like it was when they played in Santa Clara in September and third in so long in Seattle last month. When it's third and 10, Bosa and Armstead and those guys are coming after you and you're going to lose. And that's what's happened in the two meetings. So Kenneth Walker running the ball is going to really be important on the early downs so that Seattle's in third and two and three instead of third and nine and 10. And then they got to get lucky. And that's what happens when teams went on the road and upset a, a low seed, beat high seeds, that you get luck. You get the last time Seattle was this big of an underdog, eight points at Philadelphia three years ago in the first round of the playoffs. They knocked the starting quarterback out of the game in the first quarter and they won the game. The, the stuff like that, the, the game, the things you aren't foreseeing has to happen for Seattle to win. This is just a bad matchup physically. They've been absolutely dominated the line of scrimmage in the two games so far. Yeah, you mentioned third down, which is something I definitely wanted to bring up. The weather can make things kind of fluky. I mean, that can make for entertaining theater because things just get funky when that becomes an equalizer. Offensively, when you look at Seattle's offense, what do you expect them to do? And who is their their best sort of positional matchup offensively against this Niners defense? Well, they didn't have Kenneth Walker in the second week two game in Santa Clara. He was just coming off a hernia. He was a cameo appearance at best. Rashad Penny was still the lead back back then and then last month walker was beat up and ended up missing two games after that with an ankle issue he only had 47 yards on 12 carries in the game last time these two teams met in seattle in december so they they think they have a full kenneth walker for the first time he has three 100 yard rushing games in a row he's been really hot since the second half of the christmas eve game in kansas city when pete carroll looked him in the eye and said quit running laterally 
the jump cuts is what got him off to such a fast start as a rookie. And then the league caught up to that and we're waiting for him. The first half against the Chiefs, Carolina had 16 yards and the Chiefs were just waiting on his lateral cuts to cut right back into him. They weren't even penetrating through the line of scrimmage. They were just standing there waiting for him to cut back to him. And now he's running more directly and more decisively into the line. And since then, three 100-yard games in a row. So they think they have a different Kenneth Walker than can, than San Francisco has seen so far. And therefore, they think they will be in third and short rather than third and long that they were in the first two games. Defensively, they've got problems they didn't have even the last two times they played San Francisco. Jordan Brooks is not there. He's out for the season with a knee injury in the middle of their defense. So now they have Tanner Muse and uh, uh, Cody Barton, who are two inexperienced that inside linebacker making their both of their first career playoff starts and now you got a team running downhill right at them this team is really really bad at run defense because their run fits with really just two true defensive linemen the way they play their outside linebackers in chen and wosu and bruce urban as defensive ends you really only have two in the middle puna ford and shelby harris and alternating with al woods as your only run stoppers and teams have exploited that so they need turnovers they need, like you said, the weather to be a mitigating and leveling factor. Uh, but they really offensively need Kenneth Walker to run the ball to be able to use their whole offense in shorter third downs. Which is a really tough task when you've got a 49ers run defense that right. hasn't allowed a 100-yard rusher all season long. I mean, it sounds like the X factor in this game could come down to a rookie running back. If that's the case and if Kenneth Walker is able to kind of shock us all and really embrace this moment, I imagine that also takes a lot of pressure off of Geno as well. And it, 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 it'll keep the pass rush from teeing off on him as it did the last meeting in Lumen Field. Smith has been at his best when the running game has worked for him and defenses have had to play honestly. Seattle's offensive line for years has had trouble in pass protection when they have to throw when it's third and long and San Francisco's is the best in the league. So that's what I mean about running the ball. Even if it's two or three yards on first and second. I'm not saying they're going to run first, run second, and then be third. I, but they need to have success on first and second down, not negative plays. So it's not third and 12 and 10. And and that's when Geno Smith's going to be in trouble. Uh, if Eric Armstead and Nick Bosa have to play the run on third down and at least be cognizant of it and not run straight up the field, then Geno Smith's going to be a much better quarterback with more time to throw to DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett. I think there's some chances on the outside of San Francisco's defense at cornerback. Ward's been very good, but on the other side, I think they're going to target away from Ward but you need time to throw to do that. And that's something Seattle hasn't had in the two games. They're hoping the running game with Walker will allow, allow them to do that. They have surprised us before this season. We'll see uh, with a matchup that doesn't necessarily seem to be favorable, but with a little bit of wet weather, anything can happen. Uh, Greg Bell, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Safe trip to San Francisco. Stay dry, stay yeah. safe. We appreciate the insight. Thanks, Carolyn. Take care. Happy New Year. 